All right, we're here with Gary, and thank you for being brave enough. Gary at, <laughs> <laughs> Gary at Darwin's, um, and then this is the Brave Enough campaign, and you were the first to call. Um, so I first met you, I will say a few disclosures. Um, any company can participate in this. Um, and it's not up to me or my movie to recommend brands. Um, the market's constantly changing, but what I feel compelled to do is to talk to people, um, ask questions. Um, we don't have grade A, grade B, grade C, grade F. Um, so there's a trust system that happens. So I would like to visit as many places as I can because only until you go to the facility and really look and have conversations and really a relationship with manufacturers, do you really know what's going on, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I first met you with Dr. Royal. I was filming Dr. Royal for Pet Fooled, and one of the things that she was doing in the movie, well, in her life, but I was documenting it for the movie, um, she couldn't recommend a prescription diet to her clients, her cats or dogs that she was treating, because the only thing that existed was a dry food prescription diet option. So she sought out different companies and went with Darwin's to help make that. Um, and I don't know if she's told you, but I, she was like, if I would have went with that company, I might be a multimillionaire. But she went with the most authentic, non-HPP, most pure people who are doing it in what she called was right, and we can talk about that later, um, option, which was you guys. So that's how I got to come, not to this facility, but your previous facility in film anything. I've filmed everything. Um, so whenever you called, I'm like, I've already been there and filmed you. We're um, home now. Exactly. So I'm excited to be back. I'm excited to talk. Um, and I hope we can help some people by um, talking. So this concept of brave enough, um, the idea is transparency um, because we don't have grade A through grade F. Um, so how can a consumer know? So in your point of view, um, how can a consumer know? Because we've seen circumstances where it's USDA organic meat, and next thing you know, pinobarbital is in the meat, and we're not looking to do anything other than talk about from the manufacturing side. It's scary whenever you're sourcing and maybe something goes wrong with the supplier. Mm -hmm. um, but just give me an idea how can a consumer trust I think the questions that, that, that pet owners should look at when they're evaluating any pet food company, raw or otherwise, is, is first look at, the, look at the formulation, look at the ingredients. Um, uh, that tells you a lot right there. Uh, you, you've talked about it in your, in your film and other places, is just read the ingredient list and what are the first two, three ingredients? That, that tells you a lot. Um, then look at the guaranteed analysis. So there are some things right on the label that you can look at. And there are differences between even raw pet food companies just, just at that level. Digging a little bit deeper, I think asking about sourcing is a good question. And that, that's something that I think companies should be transparent about. Not necessarily naming suppliers, because that can be uh, you know, a competitive secret, if you will, or trade secret. But, but how do you go about deciding on your suppliers? In, in our case, we put a lot of emphasis on keeping the supply chain as short as possible so we are as close to the people growing the, the products as we can be. And we go out and interview every one of them, visit the farms, and, uh, and, and ask questions about how uh, those, those, those uh, animals are being raised. Um, I, I think uh, pet, pet owners can ask those kind of questions and should expect answers from uh, the people that they, they get their pet food from. And that relationship between you, the manufacturer, and people you're supplying from, for, whether it be farms or um, a supplier in between, it's that relationship that either, and it's a constant upkeep, either, either will make it or break it, because if a supplier adulterates, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, by, by knowing your actual supplier, you can minimize that, that chance. I, 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 I want to believe that the folks that, that ran the, the pentobarbital and the beef 
they didn't know it. And, and it may have been even the people that they bought it from didn't know it. Somewhere earlier on up the supply chain, somebody, somebody knew it. But um, uh, that's why keeping, keeping that supply chain as short as possible so there's less opportunity for those kind of actions to take place, I think, is important. And then, um, for people who've never heard of you, um, whenever I filmed the film, um, I went home with Dr. Royal um, because I thought the audience would want to know who is this person um, in the movie. And then I went to Dr. Becker's house, and in both situations, the only direction in the scene um, was just feed your what, do what you do. Right. And then um, I unknowingly, you know, just put everything together just based on the reality of what they were doing and then the number one question I kept getting when the film was released is, what are they feeding? Um, everyone's looking for that quick option, um, but it was never um, in my goal in speaking with people, the number one thing people will say is that you're, you know, either getting something under the table or you're doing this or you're getting that, so for disclosure, you're not paying me. You know, right. we're not paying you, and we're I, not paying them. I, I've yeah. ne exactly. I've never asked, never will ask. You've never offered. Yeah. Um, the entire point here is to speak and have conversation, because um, I believe if we keep doing that, then maybe we can move the industry into more positive, transparent light. Um, so, what did it feel like whenever you saw? <laughs> Um, Dr. Royal, feed your food in the film. I, I was I was thrilled. Mm -hmm. I, I was happy to see that. Uh, uh, you know, I, 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 when I, the first time I watched it, I, I I've never seen our product on film before, so mm -hmm. it was pretty exciting. And then we're going to go through your factory. Yeah. Um, in probably right after this interview, um, have you ever filmed in the factory? No, no. That, this will be a first. So it's your first time. Yeah. Oh, okay. Little, I feel little, very honored. A little, little nervous about that, to be honest with you, but okay. like, we'll, we'll, we'll um, give it a try. Yeah. Uh, I always say there's nothing to be nervous about. However, I mean, I always try to see it from multiple standpoints, so I do understand why it's a nerve-wracking yeah. situation. Um, um, but I'm excited that we're going to be able to do that, because I really, from the outside looking in, you want to be able to see these things. You want to know how the food is made. Um, and I keep saying grade A through grade F. Do, what do you what do you think whenever I say that? Like because I'm looking for an assurance. Yeah. So if the consumers in Kentucky buying your food, they can call you and talk about things, about sourcing, about how you do things. They can also call other companies, um, and the confusion comes in when there are tainted ingredients. So people are looking for that assured quality from an objective standpoint. Um, I think so. I, I don't know if I'm crazy thinking that we could have a grade system, depending on sourcing and quality. And yeah, I, I I don't I don't know that you can. I mean, there's there's what what folks refer to as human quality, mm -hmm. and and I think what you're thinking of is, um, you know, they have grades of beef that are you know prime and choice and things like that. Those are for for steaks and things like that. I, I think for for just general. Um, uh, things like that are ground into gr hamburger, those grades don't exist. It's it's either USDA inspected or it's not. Um, I, I mean, and and obviously everything we do is 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 comes from a USDA inspected facility. Um, what would you want people to know about you that will separate you from anyone else? Because there's a variety of options. So you do not sell in stores. Right. You ship direct to consumer um, to really, I believe, to minimize cost for the consumer. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then well, why did you go that route? Because, you know, you could have sold in stores, you know, or and you only sell in America at the moment. Right, know? right. I, I, uh, this gets kind of back to when I, when I started the company and why I started the company. Um, and, and like so many people that come to raw feeding, it all started with a sick dog. I, uh, one of my uh, my old English sheepdog Max was ill, and he had he was ten years old, but he had crippling arthritis. And I tried everything that that Western medicine had to offer at the time, and nothing was working. So, uh, kind of in desperation, I went to a holistic vet. And he now now I understand, of course. He asked me what am I feeding the dog, and I told him, and he 
he gave me some articles to read and some recipes and said, come back in a month. And in a month after making Max's food for him, uh, he was up and walking around like he was, he was a healthy dog again. And I, I started to get the connection between nutrition and health, that you are what you eat applies to our pets as well as, well as for us. Um, and in the same month, my other sheepdog, uh, Casey, who had chronic skin problems, they cleared up as well. So I, I was really, really impressed by the impact of nutrition. But whenever I talked to my friends about it, inevitably I'd get the same answer back. I don't have time to make food for my own family, let alone you know, my pets as well. How long ago was that? This is going back 20 years. 20 years. Um, and so that was crazy at that point in time because I mean it was pretty early yeah. it was pretty early on I mean there were there were other folks I mean I there were other folks feeding raw yeah there were there were actually some some brands in the stores but they were really expensive I mean they still are um, and and so the, the 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 pushback I got from my friends whenever I'd suggest this was it's too difficult to make it myself and it's too expensive to buy it in the store and so I I, I saw my mission was to figure out a way to make it convenient and affordable, to overcome the things that stop. Most people got that real food is going to be better than nuggets out of a bag, processed nuggets. But it was just too difficult to do. So that's what I took as my mission. And, and the answer we chose, the path we chose, was go direct to the consumer. Put it on their doorstep. Make it as easy as possible for them. And by, by going direct and keeping that supply chain short, both into us and out to the pet owner, um, you, you keep the cost down that way. And so that's, we've been doing that for 14 years now, right. and that formula, and it seems to have worked. Now, from the time you started doing this, like, how would you get, for direct-to-consumer, all over the country, how do you get to that yeah. consumer? Well, we, to we, to trade we, shows, we, we didn't start out all over the country. We started out just in Seattle. Uh, just, you know, we, we still have uh, some minivans that we, we drive around to our customers' homes uh, in the greater Seattle area, which is where we're based. Um, and uh, we did that for a few years, and then, but we kept on getting inquiries from around the country, and we'd have to tell them no, we, we you know, we can't service you yet. And, and then finally, we, we made the decision to to go national. So we started shipping um, out, out to the rest of the country, and then uh, focusing mostly on the West Coast. But then, then uh, we we opened up a distribution center on the East Coast and started started uh, shipping there as well. So now we're in all 48, uh, well, we're actually in all 50 states. Wow. Hawaii? Hawaii as well, yeah. We have some customers <laughs> out of there. That's cool. Um, I would love to go, I would love to put a GoPro on a package <laughs> that goes to Hawaii on the road of Hana because it took me eight hours to ten hours to get to <laughs> yeah, that road. I'm not sure we haven't done that, that far, but some, somewhere in Hawaii, I don't know where they are, but they're, I'll we, never, we actually have customers in Hawaii. I'll never forget seeing a woman who worked for the post office driving on the road of Hana, which is, if you turn wrong, you're yeah. off a cliff. Oh, yeah. She was driving with one hand and eating a sandwich, and I'm just like, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> so I want to talk about the overall approach to nutrition okay. and then compare it to what has become the raw food industry. So mm, okay. um, I think you and I have maybe a difference of opinion on, because I've made... Um, statements regarding, you know, are you doing it the right way or the wrong way? And you have a difference of opinion on me, or Dan and I do, um, you know, because I do look at certain people and say, you're doing it wrong, that's not appropriate ingredients, and it's not my job to, you know, yeah. Yeah. call them out or be mean to them publicly. Um, but there's an approach to nutrition that's appropriate, that's what I'm trying to Keep the conversation yeah, going. Yeah, and and we're we're I mean we're still learning every day about it. So there's, uh, to me, what's what's important is folks have the intention of feeding their dogs properly, and it's it's not a destination; it's a journey. You know, every, everybody's improving all along. I, I I I have seen some people that have the intention of feeding well, but the recipe they're using is inappropriate, and and I try to give guidance there, but not. Not criticize them and tell them they're doing doing it wrong. I mean, nobody wants to hear that, and and, and they're not going to be responsive to that. But I, I think uh, uh, as long as you're paying attention to what's important, making sure that it's complete and balanced, um, then you're you're probably on the right path. And you and you can go overboard too. There are some people that that 
I think everything has to be precise, and 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 I, I think you can get too um, compulsive, if you will, about what you're feeding. Yeah. Um, Some people can get in that mode of, you know, yeah, you yeah. don't have an organ. Uh, yeah, you know, I, oh, I I need to feed yeah. this percentage of of beef, and this you know, I, I, my God, I, I fed beef yesterday. I yeah, can't I, I can't feed beef again today. Well, I think uh, that stems from the scariness put out by it must be complete and balanced, you know, yeah. which. Yes, that's important, um, but then there's a way to do that. If you can do that with corn and wheat, and you can do that with more bioavailable ingredients, I mean, you can see the yeah. range. Um, so, and and the other thing is, not every meal has to be complete and balanced. It's it's an you, over time, you need to look at the overall yeah. diet to yeah. make sure that they're getting everything. That's one that thing I did learn while making the movie. I'm like, because I'm like, is each pebble complete and balanced? Like, I, it was so confusing to me understand that and I believe it was Dr. Becker who pointed out no it's over yeah I don't know what the span of time is but you yeah know. I, I don't know either but for uh, fats are a good example um, you know there are the, the fats that come in red meat are different than the fats that come in poultry yeah. you need them both mm. but you don't need them both in every meal yeah you know if you, if you eat beef one day and poultry the next day then then you're getting both nice now um, the approach to feeding when it probably whenever you started so there might have been one or two on the market. Um, now it's become an industry. Yeah. Um, so my goal in making the movie was, what is a talking cat actually supposed to eat? If it's not corn, if it's not wheat, if it's not a processed diet, because we don't think about dry foods as being processed and what that entails. Um, what is a dog or cat supposed to eat? So that's what I had to answer in the movie. Um, However, the approach to feeding has become an industry. Um, ironically, after a hundred years, the actual appropriate style of feeding. I mean, what would you say about that in regards to the approach to feeding in regards to the industry yeah. that has yeah. come out of it? Because I did not know, I honestly thought before making the movie that I was going to come out thinking, oh, well, you're supposed <coughs> to feed this kibble with this ingredient and that's yeah, what's appropriate. Yeah. I, I, I kind of say when, when I was younger, we, we thought, I'm speaking of human nutrition now, we thought that science could improve on food. Mm -hmm. You know, I, we've talked about, you know, you had Tang back then, you had Wonder Bread back then, you had all these things that, that we, we, yeah, we could improve on natural food through science. And I think, you know, in the, in the decades since then, we've come 180 degrees on that, and, and now... I think the the the, uh, the more common attitude is the less you do to food, the more you eat it in its natural state, the better it is. We're just starting to make that connection for our pets. That I mean, I, I think in the last decade, maybe I saw it midway through making the movie. Yeah, it the it started to change on the marketing. Yeah, yeah. that that the less you do, the better, um, and and I think that's what's driven our company and others like us to to. Um, to move into less processed food for, for our pets. Do you think the, it's kind of a delay of the human food industry, but, you know, talk started to happen, you know, Whole Foods came about, but then, you know, the film Food Inc. came out, and that sort of opened the conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then humans started to think about, like, well, Oh, and maybe it was to like supersize me. I mean, it's not changing, <coughs> it's not putting anyone out of business per se, but it's no. making me think whenever, oh, the hamburger's not actually good for me. I think those things are very interesting. And then there's another, another event that took place, which was back in 2007 when you had that, the melamine contamination mm -hmm. of pet food. And that opened my eyes, frankly, because prior to that, I had only thought in terms of nutrition, the benefit of raw food being... Uh, the nutritional benefit of it. There is a food safety aspect of it as well that that opened my my eyes and a lot of others that, that again, the shorter the supply chain, the better you know your suppliers and where your ingredients are coming from. And and the the, the more real those ingredients are. So they're not, the, you know, you should be able to read a label and recognize the ingredients as actual food and not meals and, and, and chemicals and things like that. Um, so that, I think, was a real sea change in, in, in people's attitudes and in the industry, that more and more companies were realizing that, that um, they need to, needed to pay attention to those issues. 
Now we're going to go through the manufacturing facility, which I can look at different aspects of your company and it's sort of like connecting dots and see, oh, you actually have control over what you're doing. And I think that's really the unsaid, proven thing to the consumer, which is all of these different aspects that are involved in manufacturing, how is it under control? How would you say being a manufacturer um, in regards to that, what are the things that are constantly difficult in order to maintain that control? You have one assembly line, if I'm correct, mm -hmm. um, which helps you maintain control because it's sure. going from one station yeah. to the next to make the fully balanced meal. Uh, in, in, in our case, I mean, I guess in most cases uh, for folks that make our kind of food, I mean, there are a couple of things that are critical. One, one is, I'm going to keep saying it again and again, make sure you know your suppliers, make sure you're, you're paying attention to how you receive those ingredients uh, that, that when you get them, they're in good shape. Um, temperature, obviously, we're talking about fresh food. You need to maintain temperature. Sanitation is critical, making sure you have a clean facility so if the food comes in clean, it doesn't get contaminated while it's in your facility. Um, and, and then just paying attention to the formulation, making sure that you're uh, making the food according to the, the recipe. I think those are the critical steps. So for the consumer on the other side, what would you think that um, a consumer doesn't necessarily know manufacturing? A lot of times it's from a mysterious source. Yeah. So what do you feel consumers should know about manufacturing that maybe they're confused about or don't know about? Mm -hmm. Like what's the difficulty in manufacturing a food? difficult thing because you deal with the manufacturing side yeah yeah I mean it's it's all difficult it's a, it's all it's all I mean you have to pay attention to it I, I, I mean, it's hard for me to pick out any any one thing that that is is is, is, is noteworthy that I uh, uh, as a consumer that I'd, I'd ask about I mean it, it's uh, you know all the things I mentioned before yeah well we're talking with you right now I'm thinking about the end product so I guess maybe it's you have the formulation and you have to have a correct end product, so everything in between has to meet that right. final goal, yeah. probably. So, yeah. I mean, anything can go wrong in manufacturing from, like, maybe your label machine doesn't work for a hot second, so you've got to figure that out. Right. Um, the, or, you know, the good news since the time you made the, 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 the first film is that, um, you know, the regulatory environment has changed. Pet food manufacturers generally are being held to a higher standard than they were before. Now we had already been moving in that direction even prior to regulation, but there's a there's a new law called the Food Safety Modernization Act, people call it FISMA for short, that holds pet food manufacturers accountable to meet the same standards as human food manufacturers. So that that's a great thing. I mean that 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 um, takes a lot of the I mean there's there's a lot of folks I think that come into this business with the best of intentions but they don't know that much about making food. And to be honest, we didn't know that much when we started out either. We, we learned as we you went, learn, yeah. but we've been around long enough that we've, we've, we've developed a, a lot of those processes. Um, now it's not optional. It's going to be required. And, that, and that's as a great, should be. That's yeah. a great thing. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I think that a lot of, I think consumers should have more confidence going forward as, as these regulations go into effect. You know, they started out being uh, required of bigger companies, and then they're moving they're, they're moving down to smaller companies as they as they uh, go forward. So so um, I think by this year or next year, all companies will be required to meet these processes. And it's really just putting the controls in place so that yeah, what what we put on the label is what's going actually going into the food, um, and that that our processes have those controls in place to make sure that the, the quality is being maintained. In a dream world, what would you want to see improvements on, like industry-wise. And I know that's difficult because you're focused on your product and what you're doing. Yeah. But what would you like to see improvements hmm. on regarding maybe FISMA or anything? You know, I, I, I'd like to see, this is going to maybe, maybe be counterintuitive, uh, less fear out in the marketplace. Uh, I, I, I think there's been a lot of fear-mongering, both by 
competitors that, that don't make raw food, and also, frankly, by, by regulators, um, uh, that, that there's a danger of raw food. Um, I, don't, I don't think that danger exists, really. I mean, I've, I've been feeding my dogs for 20 years. We're feeding tens of thousands of dogs of our customers. And we haven't heard, you know, we don't get any uh, stories of, of dogs getting sick because of pathogens or, or things like that. that. That, I think, I don't want to say it's a fallacy. Um, I mean, there are some dogs who have compromised immune systems that might be sensitive to this. If, if there are companies that make uh, their processes aren't controlled properly, it's possible that, that their products could be severely contaminated enough to, to cause some harm. But really, that's, that's, it's just not happening. It, you know, it, it, if you look across the landscape, you, you don't see that happening with raw food. So there's just a lot of fear. Um, and, and I think people say those things with the best of intentions. They may believe what they're saying. I don't, I don't see that. And, and I think that's something I, I wish could change, that we, we just you know, start operating on the basis of facts rather than you know, uh, fear. And I have two things about I mean, my analyzation of that or analysis is if I were to go look at that and really look at what people are saying, it's not coming from the space of a lot of times what's appropriate for the animal, and then um, how does it affect the animal? It's sort of like they, I've been through pamphlets, and I won't name specific pamphlets now, um, where it does go through this whole fear mongling with the word potential, yes. um, yeah, exactly. only to get to it and say a person that is a child with, an, with like a issue or a person with HIV. And it's like, okay, so you have this whole thing in, fear really for everyone and you're picking out this little tiny yeah. immune compromised um, you know fear base which of course we no one wants anyone to get sick at any level it just needs to be appropriate approaches and common sense yeah and why is that so complicated you know I, I agree. Uh, but the thing that I find interesting about um, speaking with Jim who works in your company is the amount of science that he is involved in, and I don't see it on the consumer side as um, Darwin's being this all-knowing, science-based company. I do find that fascinating from the outside looking in, because you're not you know, well, we, saying, we, you know, we're this. We, and we say we're, I mean... You're, you're, it's sort of like you're doing the work, but not marketing yourself as the all-knowing um, but I'm, I was very impressed by Jim and the yeah. amount of science that's well, we, taken. Well, we, we do pay a lot of attention to that. I mean, I, I, we, we say of ourselves, we're inspired by nature, informed by science. And that, that, was, that went into the name of the company. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I gave some thought when, when I started the company as to uh, you know, what would be a name that would uh, represent op a company that operated at the intersection of nature and science. And, and that's why I chose the name Darwin's. Um, but I, I, science is very important to us. I mean, we, we uh, in the way we formulate our diets, we start with what what we're, we understand to be the, the, the pet's natural diet and what, what they would eat in the wild. But then we bring into uh, into account the um, what science can contribute in terms of of uh, the specifics. What are the specific nutrients, and make sure that we we uh, we meet those levels. So so yeah, we don't we don't. Uh, we're not si we're not scientists, um, but we 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 bring them into the uh, uh, into the process uh, at every stage. I, I was just fascinated by other companies um, that I've seen that do really force that down. We are scientists. We have this test. We have proven um, that our ingredients, and it's not even raw food companies that do this. Um, do you feel like you get more? Um, either fulfillment from your personal self or do you get better relationships with customers by allowing the product to speak by itself? I'm, I'm just wondering in the scheme of it's an industry, it's competitive, you could come out with a specific, specific marketing campaign of your company, maybe you could get 10 times more customers by doing that. But instead I feel like you're doing the opposite to where it's a relationship with yeah. people, yeah, and that, then that's sort of what builds. That, that's important to us. I mean, that 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 was another aspect of why we did the direct to consumer and not going through stores. Was we love having that direct 
one-to-one -one relationship with each of our customers. If they have a problem, they can they can call us up and we can help them with it. Uh, we don't have to go through third parties or intermediaries to, to, to have that communication with them. And that's that's been both effective for us because, again, if, if, if there is an issue, we find out about it right away. But it's also gratifying because, you know, people, people tell us, this is the impact this is having on my pets. I mean, early on, um, uh, you know, when I was, we were smaller and I had more day-to-day -day, uh, uh, contact with our customers, um, we would, we would, I would get these calls and emails from customers saying, you know, I, I thought I was going to have to put my dog down. And then somebody told me about your food. And um, I, he's been eating it now for months and he's, he's healthy now. And, boy, no matter what else happened that day, it was a good Stuck day when yeah. I got one of those, one of those um, communications. And our folks still get those. They don't all, some of them get to me, not all of them. But that, um, that's the most gratifying part of this. You know, I want to feed more dogs. I want to feed more cats. I mean, we want to grow. Don't get me wrong. But, but having that relationship with the customers is really the, the best part of this yeah, business. I find that's what separates you because, I mean, if I'm the average consumer going into either a big store or a smaller store, then the relationship with the store owner yeah, exactly. is important because the store owner is facilitating all of the different options in the store. Um, but I think those relationships, whether it's with you, the owner, or the company, or the stores, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Because it's that constant exchange. Because from the consumer standpoint, you have to know if a company that you're feeding is changing, why, or et cetera. Yeah. You know? yeah. And we could, we could be responsive to them that way. I mean, yeah. that's the reason, frankly, we got into cat food. We started out as a, strictly a dog food company. And then a couple of years into it, our, our customers started calling us time saying, hey, my cat keeps stealing my dog's food. Can you do something about that? <laughs> and, and so we came up with a cat food line. Wow. Is it just as popular as the dog food? We're still or? pretty dog, you know, we have many more dog customers than cat customers. Okay. Uh, but, but the cat side of things is, is, is growing. And then um, I've heard you say this before where you've talked about or you've asked me, like, well, what does it mean to do the right thing? Because I, I get into this mode of, are you doing the right thing or the wrong thing? And you've had things to say about that. Um, I can't remember what they were. It's been well, I, I, you know, it's it's hard for me. I, I this is this is where I I, I kind of say, for many people, this feeding the way you feed your pet is, is like religion. It's uh, you know there are there are people across a broad spectrum many of whom are well-trained, who have very different opinions on how things should be done. I mean, you, I, I remember in, in your first film, you, you, you had, uh, the, I, I got, forgot who the woman was, but she was a scientist. I think she, I don't, she worked for a pet food company, but she was well-trained, who said, corn is a great ingredient to put in pet food. Wow. Uh, you know, there are, I guarantee you there are people who are equally well-trained who say that's one of the worst things you can put in pet food. But you, you can't just say, oh, you're wrong. All you can say is, I disagree. I, I see things differently. If you, if you try and say this is the one true way to feed a pet, I think you're in danger of, of, uh, uh, of alienating folks and, and, and of, of being closed-minded. Because I'll tell you something, we're still learning. And things that we thought were true 15 years ago we think differently now. So I, I'm reluctant to, to tell somebody, no, you're wrong. Mm. Rather, what I, and I encourage pet owners to, to, to do the same thing. Rather than say, is this right or is it wrong? Listen to all the perspectives. Make up your own mind. Yeah. And, and decide on what's right for your pet. Because there's no one-size-fits-all um, approach to this thing. Um, even within the raw food industry, yeah. you're going to get that. Yeah. Is it? This amount of bone, that amount of bone. This organ, this organ. Yeah. Is it tried? No tried. So you I, have I think that. I mentioned to you I, w I was thrown off a chat room once for suggesting that dogs should eat vegetables. Mm. Uh, these folks felt passionately that they should only eat meat. Mm. Um, I, I can I can give you you know the citations from a lot of folks whose opinions I respect that say no domestic mm. dogs should definitely have vegetables yeah. in their diet. And, uh, are these folks wrong? 
No, I just disagree with. And two, I mean, it's the difference on the other side. Are you citing it? You're citing it on that chat room how many years ago? This is going back 14 or so 14 years. 14 years. Um, I mean. They haven't invited me back. It's a, well, it's a, it's a <laughs> difficult thing. Um, and the thing I find is that you're coming from a health approach. Like nothing in whenever I talk to you is, um, and I don't know if you notice this about yourself, is um, you're not adding on to what you just said, saying, you know, promoting your product in regards to vegetables. Like your interest is. Yeah, what's right. Yeah, I find yeah. that fascinating because the difficult thing for me is I want to talk to different companies, but it's all always a sales pitch with certain companies. And it's difficult because we want to talk about the approach. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate that and, and being we're, able to talk about it. We're, you know, no pun intended on the Darwin's thing. We're evolving still. Our recipe, <laughs> our recipe is evolving. Mm. Our, our, you know, I mean, we, when we started out, we were thirty percent vegetables. Now we're twenty-five. Mm. You know, they're, they're, they're you know. It, it, Why did you do that? Well, we just, we just, as we, as we looked at, at nutrition and, and understood more, and, and also the, the. The standards have changed a bit too. I mean, you, you know, we, we used to uh, adhere strictly to AFCO standards. Um, now, we still do, but now there are there's another set of standards called NRC that mm -hmm. we also pay attention to. And as we as we look at those things and and talk to more people and understand uh, pet nutrition more fully, um, we we just felt like higher protein levels uh, were, were appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanted we part of it was we wanted to get the caloric density of our food. Up a little bit higher, so that that um, the dogs wouldn't have to eat as much to get their caloric intake, and so that that shift was in large part because of that. And then one interesting thing that is random and off the wall is um, whenever things become an industry, uh, lobbying groups get into the fray. Um, do you see yourself sort of? Out, I've spoken to. The, a different company about this saying you know we're just charting our own path and you know yeah we're not really going to the tr trade shows for you know um, lobbying groups or etc um, yeah there, there used to be a lobbying a small lobbying group and it may still exist we don't we don't belong to it um, I don't have a, I don't I'm not opposed to I mean the, the term lobbyist has a bad mm -hmm. connotation but but the fact of the matter is government is 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 regulating our industry and um, somebody has to represent our, our industry or, or pet food manufacturers just to to make sure that that um, they're not going overboard yeah. or that they're doing the right thing or that they're 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 taking everything into account when they develop those regulations it's not necessarily a bad thing Correct. to to have uh, somebody representing the industry now when they're doing it in defense yeah as always. or or, yeah. or uh, it, when they're doing it at, at the um, and being harmful to consumers, then I think there's, uh, you know, then they've gone a little bit too far. I, I, I don't think the raw pet food industry is anywhere close to that point. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who knows who will be uh, The larger pet purchased, food industry might be, you know. but, but the raw pet Well, food I see a lot of defensiveness. From, uh, anything the industry does, I've seen a certain lobbying group just, you know, it's always in defense mode, and it's like, that's kind of not the point. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, you know, but um, yeah, I don't know if we have any questions that we want to answer from the world. So we're worldwide. Um, I can't read that, my love. <laughs> twenty five. I'll read it. Is twenty five percent vegetables still considered a high amount? Okay. Boy. Well, uh, I, I guess my answer would be it depends. Uh, um, and and everybody has different opinions. Now, this we're speaking. I, I want to clarify. We're speaking of dog food right now. Cat food, um, cats, I'm going to say it's our opinion, but I think it's fairly broadly held, are carnivores, and they don't eat vegetables. Obligate, yeah. yeah. And so, um, you know, there's, there's virtually no vegetables in our cat food. Um, with, with dogs, um, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't know how to answer that, whether it's a high amount. We think it's the appropriate amount. There are, there are I'm sure, formulations with less vegetables. Mm -hmm. There may be some formulations that have more vegetables as well. Um, I, I, I guess I, I get away from, is it right, is it wrong? The question is, is it right for your pet? Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. And then, do you actually think the industry should, or um, do you think it would be beneficial if we 
improve upon APCO standards, meaning if that's considered our base, like there are improvements to be made. Do you think the industry has the ability to move away from APCO standards to a better standard system? Mm. There are probably people that would be better informed on that issue yeah. than I am. Um, I, would you be I, open to that as a manufacturing? Oh, sure, sure. I mean, that to me is a baseline. It's, okay. it's, it's, it's the starting point. Mm. Uh, it's not the ending point. Okay. Uh, you know, we, we exceed AFCO standards on a lot of, a lot of different dimensions. Um, you know, it, but, but, we, but we, we meet every AFCO standard there is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why I was mentioning earlier that NRC, uh, the National Research yeah. Council, um, the folks that we talk to whose opinions we respect regarding uh, veterinary nutrition, they feel like NRC standards are more appropriate okay. than AFCO. And so we pay a bit more attention to those to, to look at, but those are, those are tougher to meet. So we're meeting AFCO standards, but in addition we're meeting NRC standards. Yeah, I keep saying that baseline what's generally appropriate for the animal and then build from there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, hmm. do you recommend feeding large dogs one time a day or two times a day? Yeah. Um, and it, I've, I've met people who feed once a day. I've met people who feed six days a week and then they fast yeah, one day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, for me, uh, I, I feed our, my dog, uh, and it's an 80-pound retriever, um, uh, twice a day. And I do that. I had an experience with one of my sheep dogs year ago, years ago that got bloat. Um, and I don't know if you know what that is. That's, that's where the stomach mm -hmm. kind of flips, and, and it, it, it's, it's really bad. And that, I was feeding the dog once a day then. And, one of, and they don't really know what causes that. But one of the theories is that it, if you feed a big meal to a large-chested dog, um, it kind of weighs there and, mm -hmm. it, and it can cause the, the system to, uh, to, to um, invert, I guess. And boy, if you've gone through that ever with a dog, you never want to go through that again. And so I shifted to twice a day. Okay. I think maybe with smaller dogs, that might not be so critical. So I don't, again, there's no right or wrong. Um, there, I know the, a lot of our customers feed once a day. A lot of them feed twice a day. Okay. It's what's best for your dog, okay. but but for 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 me and my larger dogs, I think twice a day is the is the way to go. Nice. I, I've met people that feed three times a day. Um, three? Yeah, yeah, just <laughs> smaller meals. <laughs> well, that's uh, interesting. Well, I'm ready to go to the manufacturing part of this if you're ready. Okay. Um, so we'll end our live thing. If um, the audience watching can watch. Um, probably what is going to become a webisode, a webisode. Um, so you're the first, it's the first time I'm doing this. Um, and yeah, we'll put the webisode on YouTube just for, you know, speaking to you about what you do and who okay. you are. All right, great. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. My